lovely anthology of humor from uh, different places. And there was this article recently, they gathered obvious headlines, you know, headlines that were really there in the real world, and you wonder, how did anybody ever get paid money to write these? Um, one of them was, man killed, police suspect homicide. Um, <laughs> um, police raid gun shop, find weapons. Uh, larger kangaroos jump farther, study finds. Um, my favorite, prostate cancer more common in men. Uh, uh, an Islamic center has Muslim ties. Uh, so, so, so these are all real headlines that have really happened. Other real and obvious headlines uh, that anybody reading the papers in the past five years will have seen are oil prices reach record highs. Um, we've been at that steadily for a number of years now, and we're at it again this week as we teeter on the edge of the psychologically important $100 a barrel figure, potentially. Um, temperatures reach record highs, something that sadly continues year after year. What uh, 11 out of the 12 warmest years in history have been in the past decade or two. Um, and uh, troops sent off to the Persian Gulf is yet another obvious headline, sadly, that we've seen repeatedly. And as I thought a couple of years ago kind of about how, how these things all come together and the work I've been doing in oil and our oil dependence kind of loomed as a thread that is stitched through all these issues. And I'd been working on these issues for a while and I had never really understood why it is that we've been talking about oil dependence for so long and making such little progress on the issue. Um, and it's, it's that question and wondering what we might do about it that got me to write this book that I've just, that I've just finished and that I guess you're going to have a raffle on after this. Um, and I love that idea. Um, and and uh, the basic question of the book is, um, what do we do about the problem of oil dependence? And I, 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 was, I gave a proposal to McGraw-Hill and they accepted it. And after they accepted it, my editor said to me, you know, the way you're writing this book is just kind of, it's going to be a standard book. Can't you figure out some way to jazz it up? Um, and he said, you know, and we started talking and, and, uh, and an idea came to me and I said, you know, um, how, about if, how about if we do this as a White House drama? Um, and so the way, the way I've written this book is, uh, it, it'll be something that's very familiar to Tom Khalil and others. It's, it, it opens with a memo from the president. Um, and it is a memo from the president to his or her top cabinet officials and aides. And it says, I'm going to give a speech in a month on the topic of oil dependence, which I think is the most, one of the most serious problems facing our nation. What should it say? Um, and it gives, it, ta it gives taskers, it gives assignments to about 10 different cabinet agencies and White House offices. Um, and it says, tell me the national security problems, the environmental problems, and the economic problems with the oil dependence, and then tell me the solutions. And then the rest of the book plays out the answers that come back. Um, and just like in the real world, there are differences. And you know, one of the jobs of a White House staffer is to get input from the different agencies around the government. And then when those views are different, as they often are for very good reasons, uh, to start to synthesize them. If they're deeply different views, try to resolve them, and on the really big issues, frame them for the president and the vice president for decision. And so that's what happens in this book. And there's some different views, uh, there's a decision memo, and at the end there's a speech by the president. And one of the things that, that the president says in, in his or her initial tasking memo is, I'm going to tell some stories in this speech about real people. Tell me, tell me, about, these real pe tell me about people who provide good illustrations of this problem. And so there's the story of about 10 people who I've had the privilege to meet over the course of the past year or two writing this and kind of how they're working on, on this issue. So, um, here, here are a number of the conclusions that I came, came to in looking at this issue. I'll, I'll talk for a while and throw out some ideas, um, and then I'm delighted to answer questions and talk about this at any level of detail on, on any topic. Um, first, the most fundamental, fundamental issue is the lack of substitutes for oil in our cars and trucks. That is the most fundamental issue. Um, you know, if I am thirsty and I don't feel like this Diet Coke, I can ask for water or orange juice. If I am hungry and I don't feel like a hamburger, I can ask for vegetables or pasta. If I want to relax and I don't feel like reading a book, I can watch TV or a movie or talk with friends. If I want to leave this hall right here and go any significant distance, and I don't want to use petroleum, uh, it's going to be tough. Maybe I'm not, I mean, actually, here in the Bay Area, I'm, I'm, more, I'm better off than in most places, if that were my goal, because I could climb on the BART. Which, um, but in most, and if I'm not going too far, I can climb, I can ride a bicycle, which is fantastic. But in most places in the country, 
If I want to go any distance of any significance, I need to use petroleum. We have a global, petro a global transportation system that is utterly dependent on one commodity, which is petroleum. 96% of the energy in our cars and trucks is from petroleum. That's a figure, by the way, that's both domestic and global. 96% of the energy in our cars and, and trucks. Uh, and I think, you know, we think of that as normal. I mean, I, I grew up with that. My parents grew up with that. My grandparents grew up with this. Um, but I posit that it's fundamentally abnormal to have a global transportation system that is utterly dependent upon one commodity. And what we need to do is to create alternatives, clean alternatives that pollute less, and have a choice for consumers between different types of fuels. This, by the way, I think is a much more fundamental issue than oil imports, and we could talk some about that. Um, I mean, just a, a couple of words on that, and, and uh, in, in this, I, I, we, on the radio show we were doing, I, was, I, I really wish I could have made this point because we had somebody from the petroleum uh, industry who was talking about the importance of domestic production. Um, in the UK in the year 2000, uh, diesel prices were rising, rising so, hard, so fast that British truckers went on strike. Um, they, they went on strike howling against this. The, the, the reason that diesel prices were rising was that world oil prices were rising. Now, at the time, the UK was, you know, was an energy independent nation. It was exporting oil and gas out into world markets. But the fact that the United Kingdom was energy independent did not insulate it from rising world oil prices. And, and so there is, in, it, it, oil is a fungible commodity traded globally. And as a result, it doesn't matter whether the oil is being produced domestically or abroad. When world oil prices rise, consumers feel the pain. Um, and as a result, more domestic production might do some things that might create some jobs at the site of the local, uh, the local oil and gas production it will not have a significant impact on domestic oil prices that we see today. And, and I, find, I find actually this is a, a concept which is at odds with the dialogue in our political system it's, that it's very hard for people to take it on board. A lot of people just don't get the concept that domestic oil production has a very, very marginal impact on prices because what really matters is global, global price, uh, the global market. Um, also, by the way, um, obviously, there's no difference between imported and domestic oil when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. They have basically the same content. There's some minor variations in carbon content of oil from different fields, but you know, roughly uh, first order of uh, magnitude. Uh, I mean, actually, to, uh, the carbon content of, of, of imported and domestic oil is the same. Um, and, and we also, by the way, we, we, you know, we haven't imported any oil from Iran in 25 years. But that fact doesn't prevent Iran from using its oil card in international negotiations to threaten us. What really matters, to come back to my first central point, is what really matters here is the reliance of the global transportation system on oil. It's the fact that mobility is this basic human impulse, and we have a global transportation system that is so utterly dependent upon this one substance, oil. So what can we do about it? Um, the second conclusion that I put forth in this book is that if you want to solve this problem, nothing would do more good more quickly than making cars that connect to the electric grid. Nothing would do more good more quickly than making cars that connect to the electric grid. Plug-ins plug are key. We have this vast infrastructure for generating electricity in our country with, with plugs that reach into every home and every business, essentially. But it, it does us, as it turns out, almost no good in getting off of oil because our cars and trucks can't connect to it. Um, you know, we use, as I've said, we use about 96% of the energy in our cars and trucks is oil. Only 3% of the energy in our electricity uh, generation is oil. Um, we essentially don't, we don't use oil, in, except in very modest amounts, to generate electricity. If we, want to get, if we want to address the oil problem, the best thing we can do is find ways to connect cars to the electric grid. And here's the good news. We're pretty close to being able to do that. Um, the first important step in the technology to make that possible is out on the roads in very large numbers right now, and that's hybrid engine technology. And being here in Berkeley, I have to believe lots of people know about hybrid engine technology. Um, and lots of you are probably driving Priuses and hybrids. But ju just in case, you know, the basic concept of a hybrid is that you've got both an internal combustion engine, the same kind that we've all grown up driving, and an electric motor. And the hybrid engine switches, in most, most designs switch back and forth between the internal combustion engine and the electric motor. And that electric motor 
is re the battery is recharged by energy that's captured from the braking systems of this car um, and from ex other excess energy within the engine. Within the engine. Um, and these hybrid engines can be designed to get reasonably substantial fuel savings, 30, 40 percent, um, and it, it extends the petroleum in the car. But here's the key. They, they don't plug into the grid, the cars that are out on the road today, the Priuses. If you want to recharge your battery, you've got to start the car on petroleum, get the car moving, and the motion and other energy in the car is what recharges the battery. If you went another step and plugged this car into the grid, it would be transformational. Um, so, the really good news is I've been driving one of these cars for the past two months, um, and these cars are going to start to be on the market in much larger numbers over the course of the next co uh, couple of years. The car I've been driving is a Prius that uh, a company called 8123 Systems took, uh, converted. They took the spare tire out, and they put in a lithium-ion battery um, and a plug. The lithium-ion battery is about the size of the spare tire, and lithium is, you know, is it's light. It's the third lightest element in the lightest metal. Um, and uh, and I, I plug it into a regular extension cord in my garage every night. I uh, get about 30 or th it takes about two or three hours to recharge. I get about 20, uh, about 30 or 35 miles on a charge. Um, and I live about five miles from where I work. And so when I drive back and forth, I basically you know, use no petroleum. The, the, this, ca this car is designed so that if I go up a steep hill, it uses some petroleum. Um, but it, it's incredibly modest. And I was, after I'd dr driven this car for a week, I was very excited. I called up the company and said, I'm getting 120 miles a gallon on this really sensitive gauge that they've got. And the guy at the other end of the phone said, what? That's outrageous. We get much better than that. How come you're only getting 120 miles a gallon? Uh, you, must be, you, know, you must be accelerating fast out of the stoplights. And, and so they came down and they showed me how to ride the hills and that type of thing to capture more energy. And we, we went out, actually this guy, we drove for seven miles. This very sensitive gauge showed less than a tenth of a gallon of gasoline. Uh, and, and the gauge showed 343 miles a gallon. And, and by the way, if, if you put in E85, which is 85% ethanol in this car, this car is not designed to take it, but you could make a car that's designed to take E85, you'd be getting, I don't know, 1,500 miles per gallon of petroleum products, basically, as you drove this car along. So, so these technologies are here for radically transforming our, patrol, our, our transportation system uh, to, to reduce our dependence on petroleum. Um, one very important question I often get asked, and it is really key here, is, so is this good for global warming? Because after all, when you plug a car into the grid, the energy has to come from somewhere. And in lots of the United States, that somewhere will be a coal-fired power plant, and coal-fired power plants are terrible for global warming. The good news is, the answer is yes, it is still good for global warming to have a plug-in hybrid uh, plugged into a coal plant. And the reason is because electric motors are so much more efficient than internal combustion engines. I mean, think of that internal combustion engine that you've been driving uh, you know, your, your whole life. If you drive it more than a couple of miles, the engine gets too hot to touch. And there are, you know, uh, there's a whole radiator system and cooling system that's designed to dissipate the waste heat. And it, it's all wasted energy. Electric motors don't have a lot of that wasted energy. And the, the thermal efficiency of an internal combustion engine, and they're probably, they're engineers for a bit who are more expert than I am, but 20 to 25 percent, something like that, the thermal efficiency of a regular internal combustion engine. The thermal efficiency of a, even an old-fashioned pulverized coal plant is about 30 to 35 percent, something like that. So the, I see somebody shaking his head, so we can, we can talk about this. If you uh, don't agree, I, I'm interested in the figures, but, um, but the, the, Benef if you plug a car directly into a coal plant, um, you are still produce uh, you are with an electric motor. You are still producing fewer greenhouse gases than if you run a car with an internal combustion engine directly on oil. If you plug a car into the average grid, which is about 50 percent coal, you're doing much better. And the real answer here, by the way, is to plug a car into a windmill, either you know literally or figuratively through the grid. Um, in, in a lot of places in the United States, I think in California, I know in, in Texas where I just was, the utility manager was telling me that they have great wind resources, but the wind mainly blows at night. And he said that's a big problem for, for him as a utility manager because the electric load is much lower during the night. And the, the, they don't need this electricity. And what, so therefore what they need are energy storage systems that will capture the wind that's blowing at night. And plug-in hybrids are perfect for that. If you had 10 or 20 million plug-in hybrids on the road, people would come in, they'd plug them in at night um, and get recharged, go out, drive during the day, you'd be sailing on the wind. It'd be a, it's a, be a tremendous way to capture wind energy and drive. So 
So I think the best, the best solution here are plug-in uh, hybrids for getting us off of oil. Um, General Motors, by the way, is coming out with one in about uh, two or three years. They've announced the Chevy Volt. They're actually ahead of Toyota on this. Um, a hugely important part of the answer. Um, there are some other important parts of the answers. I'm going to talk about um, three very, a little bit more quickly. The second are biofuels. Um, and here's an observation. When I, I started writing this book about two years ago, Almost everybody I talked to was favorable about ethanol. It was amazing, just hugely positive comments. Boy, has the pendulum ever swung. I mean, as I go out and talk right now, I get much, much more in the way of negative comments and skeptical questions about, about ethanol than I do positive comments. Um, and I think that's because of the run-up in corn prices as a result of ethanol and because some of the adverse consequences of ethanol production have become more clear over the course of the past couple of years. I'm, I'm a cautious optimist for ethanol. I think that ethanol has an important role to play. Um, I think we can produce it in pretty significant amounts without a lot of environmental damage, indeed with pretty big environmental benefits. The key is that corn as a feedstock is purely a transitional step here. We're using right now corn you know, to make essentially all the ethanol in the United States, and corn takes a lot of fertilizer to grow, a lot of energy goes, and the fertilizer is largely made from natural gas, which is a fossil fuel. Um, it takes a fair amount of energy. So the, um, there's a big debate about this. Some of you may know this pretty well, about what's the energy balance of corn-based ethanol. I've kind of dug into this literature some. And my view from looking at this literature is that, that even corn-based ethanol gets you about a 20% savings on average in greenhouse gases over gasoline, which is not going to save the world. But it's, it's a good thing. And it's, it's actually, by the way, roughly comparable to the savings from some hybrids that are on the road today that people are very excited about. So. I think even corn-based ethanol is, is a good thing, but the real benefits are when we can make ethanol from other sources, and um, so-called cellulosic sources being the ones people talk about here in the United States a lot. Um, switchgrass uh, is a leading possibility. Switchgrass grows ac across much of the United States. It used to grow across the Great Plains in vast abundance before kind of, we moved in with monocrop agriculture. It takes very little fertilizer to grow, much less water to grow. Um, and we know how to turn the cellulosic sources into ethanol. We don't know how to do it in an economically competitive way right now. Um, and uh, I think that's coming. I mean, two of the, actually, two of the people I talk about in the book and, and I, whose stories I chronicle are from the Bay Area. One of them is Vinod Kosla, who must have spent some time around here, who has been talking about cellulosic ethanol a lot in the past couple of years. Uh, Kosla thinks that we can get off of gasoline complete with, completely with cellulosic ethanol in 25 years. And I, I've read the literature on this, and I, I, when I talked to him, I said, you know, I've read the literature on this, and this is a pretty aggressive projection you're making right here that we can completely get off of gasoline in 25 years with cellulosic ethanol. And his response to me was, I know, he said, but I've been around technology a lot, and there is so much money and so much brain power going into this field that I think we're going to see dramatic breakthroughs um, in the next 25 years. And he's standing by his predictions with a lot of his own money. Um, the other guy I talked to, by the way, just quickly, I should have mentioned, um, is, is Martin Eberhard, who started Tesla Motors, which is uh, an all-electric sports car which goes zero to 60 in under four seconds. Um, and he, you know, as he, as he describes it, he, he did this because he wants to save the United States and the world from oil dependence. And he's, and he's got this great fast car. He said he knows as an engineer that you, you know, electric motors have zero torque and, or instant torque. Um, and uh, and so he built this amazing sports car. And they have this thing on, the, on their website. I haven't experienced this, but I'd love to. They, they say that one of their favorite deals is to put somebody in the passenger seat um, and then say, turn on the radio. And the instant the person reaches to turn on the radio, they hit the accelerator. And the G-forces are so strong, the person you know, can't reach the radio like that. Um, but, um, uh, but there is one issue in terms of this car saving America, which is its $98,000 price tag. Um, and I said, how are you going to save the world with a $98,000 car? Uh, and his answer was, he said, look, he said, this is the way you introduce premium products. Um, that he said, think of flat screen or plasma TVs. When they first came out, they were $6,000. Nobody could afford them, but they were instantly cool. And with more volume and technological development, the price came down. He said, the basic problem with electric cars right now is people think of them as kind of boxy punishment cars that only people who are into pain and suffering would want to drive. He said, that's ridiculous. These cars are hot. Um, you know, why don't we make a hot sports car? And so that's what he's done. And, um, and they're, uh, I, I saw one in Washington a couple weeks ago. They're, they're a hot-looking car, and a lot more than I can afford. Um, 
Uh, so back to back to biofuels for a minute. The other the other thing to say about biofuels is that they um, there's a big there's a big debate right now about their impacts on global poverty and resource issues. And I think um, it's it's a really interesting issue that if any of you are looking at resource issues, I commend to you for your attention. Um, uh, on the one hand, the rise up in global grain prices um, has been bad for some uh, of the urban poor, for sure, who depend upon um, grain you know, exports. Um, on the other hand, uh, it has been, uh, on the other hand, when poor countries can develop their own biofuels production capacity, they can displace oil imports. And for a lot of countries in Africa, Actually, the benefits of debt relief have been totally outweighed over the past five years by increased oil import bills. And, and having uh, an indigenous biofuels production capacity for a lot of African countries, for example, could do wonders um, for, for addressing some foreign exchange and poverty problems. But um, there are really challenging issues about how to do biofuels production right in ways that, that are sustainable, that help reduce poverty instead of exacerbate poverty. And by the way, also in ways that are good for the rainforest. There's a huge issue right now in Indonesia with the clearing of tropical rainforest to produce uh, palm, and, uh, palm oil for uh, biodiesel. Um, and it's got to be addressed. And we need, I think what we need are sustainability standards for biofuels. Um, there's a model of this in, in the forest area, in the marine area, and I think we need standards because not all biofuels are created equal. And that, we can talk about that issue. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, another key issue here is just pure fuel efficiency. No matter what fuel you use, we waste enormous amounts of energy in our cars by making them too heavy, making them not aerodynamic enough. Um, there are some great developments coming out right now in the trucking industry. Um, great add-on technologies that are really cheap price that make those big, boxy, ridiculously designed tractor trailers that are on the road much more aerodynamic, saving enormous amounts of fuel. Um, and diesel engines are coming in a big way too, by the way, and diesel engines are more fuel efficient. Um, you know, historically, Europeans have used diesel engines in cars uh, in pretty high percentage. It's about half of the cars in Europe, new cars in Europe these days are diesel engines. But that's, they have tolerated in Europe much more soot and smog and local air pollution than we have. And diesel engines have been part of that. Um, diesel engines, you know, the, the big black smoke you see coming out of tractor trailers these days are diesel engines and, and from um, you know, diesel fuel. But we have in the United States now new regulations which have low sulfur diesel fuel and a, along with new diesel engine design are essentially going to make diesel exhaust roughly the same as gasoline exhaust. And since diesel engines are also more efficient, it's actually great, it, diesel cars are coming, I think, and they're going to be a great way to save energy. And you can combine all these technologies. I mean, you could have diesel hybrids, and diesel hybrids are coming as well. Um, OK, so in my opinion, there's one other final really important part of the solution that I want to talk about, something that's not the pollution, and then the politics, and then I'm going to answer questions. <laughs> um, the other thing that I think is part of the solution is mass transit and smart growth. Um, and we do not have a level playing field for mass transit in this country right now. If, if you want to, if you're a state and local government and you want to get money from the federal government for um, a mass transit project, you have to prove more and you get reimbursed at a lower rate than if you want to build new roads. And it's crazy. A lot of this road building, the impetus for this comes from people who want to reduce traffic congestion. And guess what? It doesn't work. It's tot it's the, the data on this is compelling. If you've got traffic congestion in an area and you widen the road, within a year or two, traffic just comes back onto the road. It reaches a level of equilibrium once again. Uh, somebody, somebody said that uh, trying to improve traffic by widening roads is like trying to, trying to lose weight by widening your belt. You know, and, and it's a, it's, it doesn't, and, and the, the data is very powerful. It, it just doesn't work. And, and um, mass transit systems uh, have huge potential for, for saving fuel. And um, this is part of a bigger package of issues. You can't just plop a mass transit system into a, a area that doesn't have reasonably dense population. So it's just part of a whole set of urban planning issues that I think need to work their way through the US planning system in ways that are not now there. Um, much more short term, I think, are, and something I got completely excited about writing this book, are telecommuting programs. 
Um, it's, the data is amazing, actually, about companies instituting telecommuting programs and the increase in worker productivity and worker happiness as a result of doing that. The improved retention rates and, you know, and, and rehiring and you know, finding new workers is one of the biggest expenses for some companies. And it saves a lot of oil, too. I mean, if people are not driving back and forth to work, there's some great data in terms of oil savings. So there's a lot of great stuff that can be done with, with telecommuting. So I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff in the whole area of smart growth and mass transit. So, I mean, the, the four areas that I point to that I think can really make a difference in terms of getting us off of our oil dependence are, just to summarize, plug-in hybrids, biofuels, improving fuel efficiency, and then smart growth or mass transit. There's one area that, I'm, that, that I think is a bad idea that's a lot under discussion in Washington a lot these days, and that's turning coal into liquid fuel. Um, and uh, this is different than burning coal in power plants. You can all, coal exists in a, naturally in a solid form, obviously, um, but it can be essentially melted or it can be liquefied. And put in cars that are on the roads today, you could just put it in, in your tailpipe and, uh, or put it in your gas tank and you could burn it. Um, uh, this is a well-known technology. The Germans did it during World War II. They didn't have access to oil and they had access to a lot of coal. The uh, South Africans did it during the apartheid regime for the same reason, they were being embargoed, they had lots of coal. And I mean, I don't know, from a symbolic level, something about the fact that the Nazis did it in World War II and that, you know, uh, this should send us a signal. Um, but uh, the real issue with this technology, this technology is pretty expensive. Uh, and I, as a result of that, I don't know that it's going to go any, uh, anywhere without a lot of government support. Um, but the real issue is that it's terrible from a global warming standpoint. It's a big step backwards from a global warming standpoint. On a life cycle basis, if you are liquefying coal to drive your cars with it, you're, you're burning about 180 to probably percent, or, or you're emitting about 180 percent to 200 percent of the heat trapping gases that you would by just burning oil. It, you know, it's like uh, replacing pasta in your diet with uh, chocolate cake or something like that. It's it, it not the right way to go. Um, and uh, there's been, there, there's sometimes you get, you know, uh, arguments in Washington about we need to be energy independent and we have lots of domestic coal, so we should develop this coal and put it in our cars. It, it's headed exactly the wrong way from a global, global warming standpoint. And it's not, a, not, I think, a good idea. Um, so just a word about the politics about this, you know, coming from Washington. I, um, uh, about a year ago, I guess, I had... Um, lunch at the Brookings Institution with Newt Gingrich, who I had never been in the same room with before. He is, uh, you know, he's a brilliant guy, I have to say. He, whatever you think about his politics, he took on a room of 30 people uh, and fielding quest, fielded all their questions, had six points on every topic people mm -hmm. asked. He's, 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 a, he's a really smart guy. Um, and, uh, and since I was starting to write this book, I said, what should we do about the problem of oil dependence? Um, and within a few weeks, I had dinner with, uh, with Howard Dean, uh, also in Washington, he was the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, also a brilliant guy, just kind of breathtaking, and his you know, former medical doctor, and his, the depth of his knowledge is really amazing. Uh, and I asked him the same question, what should we do about oil dependence? And basically, they gave me the same answer. Newt Gingrich and Howard Dean basically gave me the same answer to the question, what should we do about oil dependence? And those guys are not identical twins, let me tell you. Um, I mean, both of them said, this is a huge national security problem that we have to address as a matter of priority. Um, both of them said ethanol is a big part of the solution. Uh, both of them said we need a Manhattan Project, big research effort. Uh, both of them said that fuel efficiency of our cars and trucks must improve. Um, and so uh, for me, this was kind of an aha moment. Like, you know, we've got these two guys agreeing um, and so I started looking at the polling data, and it's amazing. I mean, 90, 95 percent of Americans think that oil dependence is a very serious problem, and I think there's a, a bit of a perfect storm of political forces here, um, driven by three things. Um, driven by, uh, first, the run-up in oil prices over the past five years. Um, driven by, second, the way that 9-11 and, and uh, the Iraq War has played out. I think, you know, across the political spectrum, people in this country are sick of men and women being sent to the Persian Gulf, as has happened twice in the past, you know, two decades. Um, and although people can articulate the links at various levels of complexity and sophistication, there's kind of a general, you know, uh, belief and awareness that the fact that, that the region that people are going over to has half the world's oil supplies is not exactly a coincidence. Um, and, and then third and, uh, is the impact on global warming. And I, I wouldn't have said this two or three years ago, by the way, but, but thank goodness, finally, 
over the course of the past two or three years, I think we're seeing enormous growth in public attention to the global warming problem. Um, and so I think these three things are, are coming together and, and um, really having an impact. Um, uh, in our political system, uh, uh, we need consensus and a fair amount of agreement in order to get anything done. And I think, you know, I'm a Democrat. Obviously, I worked in the Clinton White House. I'm thrilled that uh, Richard Lugar, who's a Republican senator from Indiana, did the foreword for my book. Um, he's ranking Republican on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I think it, it indicates the bipartisan nature of this issue. Um, and, and I really think we can make progress, in, progress on this issue in the, in the next few years. The, I think it requires presidential leadership. Our, our, although there's consensus on some of this stuff, it really requires a leader to grab the issue, t face some of the tough choices, um, and kind of help, help show the American public the way. Um, I, I think, you know, starting in January 2009, we really have an opportunity to, you know, we have a leader that commands the respect of the American people who could speak to them on this issue and really summon the folks. And I, I, think, uh, I think it could happen, and I, I think it could happen with either party. Um, and I think it will especially happen if um, the people rise up and say this is an important issue. So I'll just close with one story. Um, which will partly show my age. I was, I went, to, one, of the, one of my favorite trips in, in the past year was, uh, I went to Reynolds, Indiana, which is a town of 547 people uh, between Gary and Indianapolis. And they have decided that they are going to be completely uh, off of uh, fossil fuels. They want to rely completely on renewable energy. That's their goal. Um, and by the way, this is northern Indiana, rural town. I mean, I, I, sh I should actually go back and ask, but I, I would guess that they bet 70 or 80 percent, but they vote 70 or 80 percent Republican in this town. Um, and they, they want to be completely renewable, renewable energy is their only source. Um, and so they, they, uh, they live in the Corn Belt. They got uh, Verisun to come build an ethanol plant, and they got General Motors to sell them some discounted flex fuel cars. They got an E85 pump in town, and they're well on the way to having a transportation infrastructure in town that's almost completely renewable energy. They, um, they want to get completely off the grid. They're a live, the town with a lot of livestock, and they're using waste to generate electricity. Um, from this, and um, the town president there told me, they said, the, the biggest issue here is that it, it's hard to get anybody to believe in something that's never happened before. And I think, you know, we've been reliant on oil in our transportation system for a century. It's just, it's hard to get people to believe that it really could be different. I think he kind of, he captured this. And then I was, I was driving back to um, the airport, and I, I had rented a GPS box from Hertz for $10 a day, and this is six months ago. It was actually the first time I'd ever driven with a GPS box, and I, I went back. I, told, I was very excited. I told my teenage kids, and they were like laughing at me, saying, you know, you're like the last person in all of America um, to ever use a GPS box. But, you know, this, this, this box was, you know, was, I was driving along, and it was telling me turn right in a half a mile and turn left in 100 feet, and I was thinking, this is cool. Um, and, and, I, and I was thinking, you know, when I was a kid, it's not just that we didn't have these boxes, but it's that I never even thought of the concept of a little black box that would sit on my you know, passenger seat and talk to me and tell me, turn left in 100 feet. Um, and so then I was thinking, so after I went back and talked to my kids, so what is it that when they're my age, they're going to say the same thing about? That you know, back when I was a teenager, I didn't even have the concept of this type of technology. Um, and I, just, I think with all of the energy and attention and money and intention that's going into this whole clean energy area, um, that it's going to be at a set of technologies that will help us be free of oil. So, thanks very much. Thank you very much, David. That was great. Um, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask the first question while people think up their own. So when you had dinner with Newt Gingrich and Howard Dean, they agreed on all these areas, and I bet they also agreed on not raising gasoline taxes or carbon taxes. Can you talk a little about the politics of doing this basically on the subsidy side instead of on the tax side? Well, um yeah, well, let me talk about taxes first and then talk about subsidies, because I actually didn't mention it in my talk, and it's very important. And I do talk about it in the, in the book. Um, uh, in, in the book, I recommend um, an increase in the gasoline tax. I rec it's, what I recommend is 10, 10 cents a year, for, yeah, each year for five years. Um, and then I, I am concerned about the regressivity impacts of that, that, is, it, that the burden would fall more heavily on poorer people. And so I propose rebating. Um, 
the revenues that come in, most of the revenues that come in, to families that have, they're in the bottom half of the income distribution. And I, I would do this with checks, and I, it's kind of gimmicky, but I suggest let's mail the checks every year right before July 4th, um, so people kind of, you know, develop Independence Day and that type of thing and get some positive association here, you know, have the checks arrive, they would increase each year, the checks would increase each year as the gas tax increases. I have no illusions. I mean, it's easy to recommend a gas tax increase when you draw your salary from a think tank. It's a little bit harder if you have to face the voters um, you know, for your job. Um, and so I talked some about the politics of this, and there's no question that it's challenging. Um, I, think it, you know, I think it can be done. And there's, there's an interesting discussion going on right now in Washington, D.C. About, about carbon taxes, um, which is kind of a variant of this. And people are now saying maybe instead of a cap and trade program, we should have carbon taxes. Um, uh, I, I think uh, you know, th there's uh, an experience in state governments in the past five or ten years in which they've managed to raise gasoline taxes without big political opposition. Um, and there's a broad experience of uh, if you use the money for a specific and popular purpose, it makes it, e you know, it, makes it possible. So I think there's possibilities with taxes with no illusions whatsoever about the political challenges. I don't know if that gets to what you were asking about, Severin. Um, I, I, uh, the other side of that is the subsidy side that uh, Gingrich is very fond of saying he would never raise taxes, that he, what, what he would do would support alternative, uh, re alternative technologies and then never talks about where the money would actually come from. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, look, I think subsidies make sense in a lot of areas. Um, you know, one, it's another point, this is another larger point, but... Um, you know, people sometimes say, well, the ethanol industry is so ridiculously subsidized, or, you know, how, could, why, how do you justify all these subsidies for plug-in batteries that you're talking about? Well, um, you know, the oil industry is where it is today because of subsidies from the federal government over the course of a century. And, um, and in fact, I would even make a stronger statement that the dominance of the oil industry is the result of big government over the course of the past 50 years, and even more. I mean, um, the, the kind of smaller things, but not insignificant things that have been done are, are production tax credits of different kinds and depletion allowances and then preferential rates for drilling on public lands. The really big subsidy, if you call it that, that the oil industry has received is attention from presidents and secretaries of state over the course of decades to ensure the safe transit of oil around the world. I mean, this is, that seems to me an incalculable benefit. I, this has been a, pr a priority of presidents and secretaries of state to make sure that oil lanes were secured. Um, there's an analogy here, by the way, in the kind of banks that are too big to fail. Because we are so reliant on oil, presidents and secretaries of state, and by the way, not just in our country, but you know, ministers in other countries feel they have no choice but to make sure that oil flows. If that weren't the case, you better believe that businesses that depended upon transit would be investing in alternatives so that if there were, you know, interruptions in oil supplies that they would have alternatives that they don't now have. So. Okay, we have time for a few questions before uh, we have to wrap this up. I'm going to Okay. Hi, my name is uh, Eugenio Urquiza. Uh, my question is, why do you suppose that, in the, that the U.S. is approaching this problem as if it hasn't been solved before or in other places? There are plenty of examples of countries that have achieved energy independence um, that have no, or, no domestic oil, gas, um, or coal. And I'll give you the example of France. Um, in France, they use nuclear power to generate their electricity. This is baseload electricity, so it's not intermittent like wind or solar. Nuclear has the lowest life cycle carbon emissions of any of the major uh, of any of the sources, including sol uh, solar and wind. So why why does why does why do American politicians prefer to sell a war uh, in Iraq over petroleum than to sell the idea of a technology that exists already and that produces virtually no carbon emissions? So there are a couple of things in that question. First, let me make a basic point, which is that in our country and in most countries, including France. We really have two different energy markets. Sometimes they're often conflated into one. We have a market for electricity generation fuels, and then we have a market for, for transportation fuels. Okay, France uses what is about it's about seventy or eighty percent of its electricity generation comes from nuclear power. France, and there are a lot of a lot of things we could say about the pros and cons of nuclear power for doing that. France is completely dependent on petroleum to move its cars and trucks. 
Okay, completely. I mean, I mean uh, it's, uh, I don't know the figure off the top of my head, but I've, I'm confident it's in the 95% range of the fuel to move France's cars and trucks comes from petroleum. And French drivers and truck drivers right now are feeling the pain as world oil prices go up. So I, I do not think your premise of your question about other countries having solved this problem is correct. There is no country in the world today that is independent of oil in its transportation sector with, I mean, actually, period, uh, full stop. The closest you could get are desperately poor countries that really, you know, are, that don't use, uh, that don't have motorized transportation. Um, and then Brazil, which actually has replaced about half of its ethanol, uh, half of its gasoline with ethanol, but only half. So they still remain dependent on gasoline as well. One more question. I was wondering if you'd comment, you know, when you mentioned that 95% of the world's vehicles run on oil, if you look at the other 5%, electricity is probably second place among those, that compressed natural gas is, yeah. is probably the other leading vehicle fuel, and whether you'd <laughs> comment on that and whether you see more of an application for it in the United States. Yeah, and I should have just didn't have time to get into that. Um, I, I actually... It, it, biofuels is the other p big piece of that. I mean, I think bi biofuels, a lot of the... The, the energy in that four or five percent is biofuels, but but compressed natural gas has has uh, it's a cleaner fuel than oil. It has a lot of potential um, to handle municipal fleets, for example. Um, uh, there are a lot of bus fleets around that can and do run on natural gas. It still uh, creates some geo. There's there's some geopolitical issues associated with natural gas supply. I mean, we still have. Uh, we, we would have dependence upon places like Bolivia and Qatar that, that if, if we were heavily reliant upon natural gas. Um, but there, are, there is absolutely potential to increase use of natural gas in our transportation system. Okay, well, uh, uh, it's time for the raffle now, so I'm going to turn.